Good evening, everyone. I'm Paul Skinner, founder of Marketing Kind, and welcome to this Marketing Kind exchange in which we'll be asking, is marketing nearly there yet? With Marketing Kind founding member, Rory Sutherland, and of course, with my co-host and also fellow Marketing Kind member, Claire Lowe. But of course, we can't launch straight into this evening's conversation without first acknowledging and recognizing the truly horrific situation in Ukraine. Uh, many thousands of people have already lost their lives and our thoughts are with everyone who is trapped in uh, the most terrifying circumstances with the, the more than three million people who have now managed to leave Ukraine but with absolutely no idea when they may be able to return. With the 73,000 child refugees that the conflict is creating every day uh, and of course with the uh, with everyone involved in the deeply courageous resistance efforts uh, and also with the, the thousands of um, Russians who, despite very limited access to information um, and at genuine risk to themselves, are nevertheless coming out to protest against the invasion. Uh, at Marketing Kind, we're a small community, so we don't have a, a surge capacity but we're inviting people to support the Disasters and Emergency Committee's um, appeal through our upcoming Coffee with a Cause and that people can already start to support now, of course, and find out more about at deck.org.uk. Uh, voluntary uh, sanctions, as well as um, business support for relief efforts, of course, have important roles to play. Many of our members will be thinking through what more they can do through their businesses, through their brands, through their organizations. And if anyone would like to join a working group at Marketing Kind so that we can support each other in those activities, please do get in touch. And also keep an eye out for some of our further upcoming uh, gatherings, such as our next Your Marketing Kind gathering on the theme, We Are All Ukrainians Now. And by way of a brief introduction to Marketing Kind, because we're aware that we've got many guests with us tonight, um, we're a community of business leaders, of marketeers and of change makers who believe that the solutions to many of the world's most important problems depend upon new forms of human communication and cooperation and can therefore be read as marketing briefs in disguise. As a community, we support each other to become more conscious leaders. We use our expertise to support good causes and we seek to understand and to influence the stories that are influencing the bigger systems that we're part of. Um, and that leads us perfectly into tonight's topic. Yes, yeah, so, so welcome aboard everyone because this evening's conversation promises to be quite a journey. We're going to start by exploring how marketing can help us to take better journeys in the quite literal sense of making transport more people friendly. Um, we spend pandemics withstanding a surprising proportion of our lives and our income on transport. And whether that feels more like a highway to heaven or a road to hell, it turns out it's not just a, a matter for individual concern because transport of course gets to the heart of some of our more complex challenges from the climate emergency to the well-being agenda to revitalizing our towns and cities. So we're also going to segue into exploring how marketing can help us take a better journey through life in a more metaphorical sense. There is a, a long tradition of thinking of life as a journey and it turns out that that has deep psychological underpinnings because we map the world around us in stories uh, and if we can change those stories for the better, we can reach more rewarding destinations. So what does the journey to a better life look like? And how ready is marketing to help us find the way? And we're in great company um, to find out. So as a founding member, I'm one of the leading voices in behavioral change. Uh, Rory's most recent book written with Pete Dyson, um, Transport for Humans, Are We Nearly There Yet? is quite literally all about journeys and travel. And in exploring the complexities of travel, um, Rory has identified a number of ways of upgrading our thought processes in order to make journeys both more human friendly and sustainable. And we think this is a really exciting way of looking at marketing 
and problem solving in a different way and will give us insight into potentially how we can look at some of the bigger challenges that we face um, today. These insights build on Rory's work as vice chair of Ogilvy and founder of their behavioral practice. His previous book, Alchemy, which I'm sure many of you on the call today have read and have loved as much as I have. Um, his TED Talks have had over 7 million views, BBC documentaries, um, his Wikiman column in The Spectator, and obviously he's a, is a huge participator um, and a big part of Marketing Kind. So we're really excited, um, Rory, to talk to you today. Um, I also have a little bit of insight that you have a background as a scholar of classical antiquity, so we may well get <laughs> onto that topic and see if, again, that can help us just in explore, exploring all things. I, I'm um, dangerously rusty. Uh, please don't ask me to translate <laughs> any inscriptions. Well, the, the problem with translating inscriptions is that the sculptors, to save money, I believe, um, inscriptions usually don't have the full word. No, they don't. No, absolutely is, right. So actually, it's quite tough, even if you are a scholar of classical antiquity. And by the way, um, little known bio point, but of course, before your marginal role in advertising, you had an epically legendary role as a probationary classics teacher at the school that I arrived at just six months too late to enjoy the <laughs> experience of learning about- I never knew. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I would have got through my Caecilius Estinatrio with you uh, if I'd been just a little bit older. Um, but uh, Rory, let's turn to, to Transport for Humans. Now, I, I, I think you live right next to a train station. I know that you made it, um, you took a flight to Geneva once, all the way to Geneva Airport to be able to get a haircut on a no, 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 I didn't do that because it would have been environmentally ab abominable, but it did occur to me that it was the oh. only place I knew where you could get a haircut on Sunday. I um, think I know the exact salon. Um, because I happen with my humanitarian background, I've spent a lot of time in, in Geneva. And of course, you're a very peculiar uh, airport, by the way, by the fact that you go through security and your liquids are checked and you're checked for sharp objects, metallic objects and everything else. And you arrive through security and you turn right. And there's a massive shop selling knives, specifically Swiss Army knives. Uh, and that's actually airside. I've never understood that. So they search you for everything and they confiscate your toothpaste or whatever. And then you go through security, there's a knife shop. OK. Well, it is, of course, a major part of the Swiss national brand uh, to foreground the Swiss army knives. Um, but uh, also I'm thinking of your sort of epically legendary talk, uh, TED talk, featuring how we can improve customer experience on the Eurostar. So, so my opening question for you is, you know, when we turn to transport for humans, how much of that was inspired by empirical research and how much of it was inspired by you being a, a sort of unusually self-aware and reflective traveller? Actually, I think it comes down to this question, which marketers don't realise how different they are. And not even marketers manage to do this all this often, which is it's what you might call the 90 degree flip which is that everybody else in an organization looks at the organization through the lens of aggregate data, averages, um, you know, effectively, uh, you know, a, a massive great combinatory effort where you take all the passenger journeys and you lump them together and you look at them as a snapshot in time, okay? And it's only the marketer within the organization, Mark Ritson calls it the 90 degree flip, who, when marketers are at their best, they simply do a very simple thing, which is they take a uniquely divergent point of view on the, the organizations they serve, which is to look at the organization as experienced through the lens of a customer's eyes, a single customer's eyes, not necessarily an average customer's eyes, but a, you know, a, a customer's eyes over time, experientially, with the idea, by the way, that the consumer also has a memory of past experiences and that every single interaction contributes towards one's perception of a brand. Um, and what you realize is that I think the problem that marketers often face is one, we don't always do it ourselves because we're confronted with data, which is all about snapshot aggregation, not truly narrative um, longitudinal information about what it feels like to be a human being. 
And secondly, when we do do it, we don't realize how distinct this position is and how rare it is elsewhere in an organization. Because most people are taking kind of the shareholder view or the logistics view or the chief operating officer view, which is looking at the business through effectively the lens of a spreadsheet. And, you know, to quote, this is probably decidedly politically incorrect, but to quote Zulu, you know, the film Zulu, it's, it's only us. If you want to have the narrative view of the, the consumer, how it actually feels like to experience your brand and your service over time, uh, over a series of sequential interactions as a consumer, it's, it's just us, only us, right? And we don't, I don't think we realize how weird it is. And we don't realize in some ways the massive incomprehension we get when dealing with other parts of the organization possibly arises because they don't think of the, of the world like that at all. And when we talk to them through that lens, they think we're being weird. And so that's a great, very helpful Mark Ritson. I used to call it the 180 degree flip. And when I heard Ritson call it the 90 degree flip, I realized he was kind of right. It is 90 degrees. I don't know why I called it. The, I was I was talking about the other end of the telescope. I think Ritson's right. I think it's 90 degrees. Um, I, I wouldn't take him on anyway, because um, uh, he'd swear at me a lot. But um, uh, the, the interesting thing there is that I think railways and transportation are a very, very special case because, one, you generally don't get free competition. Now, you know, businesses like Unilever can't help but notice that some things are more popular than other things. And the, what, what makes for a successful product is not necessarily what the designer of product would think was important about that product. OK, and I think transport, particularly public transportation, obviously car design indulges consumer preference a lot. OK, you know, if you want to sell to Americans, I, I, by the way, I'm not making this up, actually. Um, Volkswagen, um, but despite having to pay billions in compensation for the Volkswagen scandal, where they uh, effectively cheated the tests, there are there were barely any Volkswagens in the United States. I mean, the number of I drove for three weeks around the United States, and I think I saw two Volkswagens in the entire time. Um, now, <laughs> the reason there were so few, <coughs> and I'm not making this up, is because the German engineers who designed Volkswagens, now bear in mind, they're European, so European cars tend to be manual transmission, not automatic. There are a few other differences. But the Germans would refuse to put cup holders in the cars. I'm not making this up. I spoke to people at KFC and McDonald's who said that, um, interestingly, national peculiarity, um, you can't make drive throughs work in Germany because something like 50 to 60 percent of Germans will not allow food or drink in their car under any circumstances. I mean, even a bottle of water, because the car is kind of like a temple. And if you had like a bargain bucket sitting in the back, that would be defiling their car. So you can't make drive throughs work very well in Germany. They just won't have it. And in France, it's easy because that, you know, the, the inside of the, your car is kind of a tip, you know, but it's very, very interesting. Um, and the, the is it 24%? 2.4%. No, no, oh, it's not 2.4% of Germans won't allow food. This no, 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 I think this is back to the, uh, to the Volkswagen share oh, in the States. It's you're absolutely right, thank you, thank you, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Uh, I, I was thinking I was way out there. My goodness, because uh, we, we got, I don't know if you know, but he'd know the difference. He'd know the facts. No, but it's very, very interesting because um, they wouldn't put cup holders in. And it was a very German thing. And what happens, I think, a lot in transport, particularly public transport, is they over optimize the service around the things they can measure. Rather than the things that consumers care about. Now, um, I'll give you two lovely stories about this which is that we probably obsess about the objective and operational qualities of a service too much. And the other softer, less quantifiable uh, aspects of a service a little, a little too little. There's a lovely story from Alex Batchelor, who used to be the marketing director of the Royal Mail. And they couldn't understand it because they had areas of the country where <laughs> effectively um, the service was terrible. But people loved the Royal Mail. People thought the Royal Mail was a fantastic brand. And they had other parts of the, of the country where people didn't like Royal Mail very much, but the service was brilliant. 
And they couldn't make sense of this at all because they're going, you know, does not compute. You know, next day, first class performance in this area is 99.3%. And yet they're not very impressed. Whereas here it's 92%. And they love us. It turned out that the single biggest criterion for whether you liked Royal Mail or not as a brand was whether you liked your postman. Now, I don't know what made the areas different. I imagine in South Wales, right, where everybody's quite chatty and nice. I guess, you know, the post wasn't arriving much, but your postman was, all right, then, you know, you can just imagine. You can just imagine areas of the country where postmen will be disproportionately likable, I suspect. And similarly, they did research on what people wanted uh, on a journey between London and Manchester. And a faster journey only came in at something like number seven or number eight. And the things people actually cared about, they said, we'd like politer staff, better coffee on board, you know, better Wi-Fi. So the things that rail people obsess about, partly because they, as in an engineering culture, that's where you derive your status. OK, now we always have this quite rightly, I think we sometimes have an attack on advertising agencies because we think they're producing advertisements to impress other advertising creatives, not to impress the consumer. And by the way, that's a fair, it's sometimes a fair criticism and it's something to be really alert to. But actually that's true of almost all professional cultures that you're much more sensitive to peer group approval than you are to overall success, um, overall success in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And so it's particularly noticeable, I find, that the innovation in rail was misdirected. So I always talk about marketing, I always talk about two things. There are unmet needs, and, you know, the, the holy grail in marketing is to some extent to do a Red Bull or a Five Guys or a um, Nespresso, where you discover basically and satisfy an unmet need, an unmet need that nobody knew about because it was kind of unspoken because it was actually unthought. You know, that's that's one holy grail. But there are also, I think, in marketing things which I call met unneeds, mm -hmm. which are things we don't really care about that much, provided they're within a, re a reasonable um, what you might call, uh, you know, a, a, a reasonable, tolerable bounds. You know, it, it's rather like that business where you fine a railway company for getting into Charing Cross four minutes late. A railway company gets fined, right? Mm. I go, I mean, unless you're Swiss or majorly anally retentive, okay, who plans a day in London without leaving a 20 or 30 minute buffer? Okay, if your office was directly above Charing Cross Station, and you time your journey to, to the precise minute, I guess you might be slightly discombobulated by the train arriving three minutes late. But I mean, seriously, right? You know, as long as you're within the bounds of tolerance, you're doing fine. We're not that bothered by, you know, three minute time savings, five minute delays, because we've already built that in anyway. Okay. And so what you'd start to see is you'd start to see this extraordinary effort solving a problem which was badly defined to begin with. So one thing is, okay, two things, okay. Um, most rail, most models, most transport models don't differentiate between uh, the time saved by a thousand people making a journey twice a year. And let's say 10 people uh, who make the same, let, let's, let's make the math simple, okay. Let's say 200 people who make a journey once a year and uh, one person who makes a journey 200 times a year. Now. They're both an equivalent time saving in aggregate. OK, now the, fir the first one is arguably high speed too. lots and lots of people travel between Manchester and London um, several times a year. But the number of people who do it weekly is, oh, crikey. Hold on. I've got to change camera. Just give me a second. Sorry about this. I won't be a second. Promise. There we go. My camera's just died. My other camera. There we go. You I'll, you'll see me again in a second. Um, but the, the, the point I'm making is that can you still hear me? Yeah, you can, 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 we can yeah. see you again now. Fantastic. Reanimated. I'm reanimated. I'm back from the dead. Um, the, the interesting thing is that obviously, in terms of aggregate time saved, they're exactly the same thing. Okay. In the same way that without loyalty programs, by the way, a supermarket can't distinguish between a product which thousands of people buy once every five years, you know, which might be, for example, Angostura bitters or a big bottle of Tabasco, right? and products which a few people buy every time they visit. You know, you can't tell the difference between those two things. Now, actually, it's an important distinction, even if you're a supermarket, because if there's a small percentage of people who are super loyal to an obscure product, you probably don't want to delist it. 
uh, because they may go and shop elsewhere. You do that two or three times and you'll, you'll find they've gone somewhere else to shop. And in the same way, okay, High Speed One, if you live in Canterbury or you move to Canterbury, High Speed One is a total game changer. It means you can now get a job in London. You know, that changes your life. It means that, you know, you can live in Canterbury and your wife can work in London or your husband can work in London. OK, it's a total game changer because that's a journey you might have to take 100, 200 times a year. To be honest, the number of people who travel to Manchester on what is what will be high speed too, the number of people who make that journey more than once a month is so small. OK, all you're doing by spending 100 billion pounds on that is you're at your rewarding a large number of people with a mild annual convenience it's not the same thing it's not the same thing in terms of behavioral change and the minutes you save although they look the same on a model they're not the same psychologically they're not remotely similar and that's that's again a 90 degree flip and i actually suggested several ways in which you can make the journey to manchester faster and increase capacity on the trains which wouldn't involve any engineering expenditure at all okay and one of them is very simple, by the way. Um, if you want to reduce my, the pain of my tri tri next trip to Manchester, just tell me 15 minutes before it leaves which sodding platform the train's at and let me board it, right? Because once I'm sitting on the train and I've plugged in my laptop and I've got the Wi-Fi working, I don't really care whether we're moving or not. I'm a happy bunny, okay? You know, instead, they do this weird thing where they only announce the platform three minutes before departure. And they have this weird thing that says, preparing train like it's a bloody cake or something right now <laughs> that would make a big difference psychologically it would be irrelevant in terms of journey time but in terms of quality time in terms of a quality of subjective appreciation of the time the 20 minutes i don't have to spend like a dickhead standing around the forecourse of euston station is a real bonus now i went even further and said look First of all, of the only really overcrowded trains from London to Manchester are the first, it's the first off-peak train of the day, is typically overcrowded, okay? Because people save a stack of money waiting till that particular train, and so therefore there are too many people on it. Now, you could actually just stagger pricing, and you could reduce a lot of the overcrowding problems, okay? That's the first thing. Second thing I said is, look, every time I go to Manchester, I buy an advanced ticket. OK, now, because I'm coming from Kent, anybody, to be honest, coming from anywhere in London that isn't walking distance of Euston Station, you have to allow a kind of 30, 30 minute margin of error to make sure you don't miss the train you're booked on. Because if you do miss the train you're booked on, your ticket is completely invalid and you have to pay a billion pounds for a full fare ticket to replace the ticket that's now void. And I said, all you want to do, because I turn up 45 minutes early from Kent, typically, OK, during the time I'm waiting for my designated train, there are two trains that leave 20 and 40 minutes before my train to Manchester, um, which are leaving half empty. I said, why don't you just develop an app where it says, OK, I'm at this now. SeatFrog might make this possible eventually. SeatFrog is a very interesting app, by the way. I'll, I'll, we can talk about that later. But it's a highly intelligent uh, app. I'm a big fan where you go, look, I'm at Euston already. You can tell from my GPS I'm at Euston. I'm not lying. Let me pay five quid or 10 quid, and I'll go 40 minutes early or 20 minutes early. Now, that not only reduces my journey time by 40 minutes, okay, or 20 minutes, it also massively improves the capacity of the overall train network. Because if you allow people to travel early in unoccupied seats, you free up later stock, to take whatever level of demand happens. I don't want to get into the intricacies of yield management here or you know, revenue management or whatever, but effectively allowing people to go early when there's spare capacity is always good practice. You can't allow people to go late, okay? Important distinction, but allowing people to go early when there's spare, EasyJet do this, okay? If you turn up really early at the airport um, for EasyJet, and they will actually say to you, look, you're booked on the Gatwick flight at five, but there's some seats at the, on the Luton flight at 3.30, if, you, you know, if you're happy. And provided you didn't leave your car at Gatwick, you might go, yeah, what the hell? I'll get on that one. And that gives them an extra chance to sell some, your seat on the Gatwick flight, because they know they aren't going to sell any seats on the Luton flight. Those, it's a perishable good, right? And what was so interesting about that is it is inarguable, OK? And I've had various people, you know, transport ministers and people say, yep, you're right, that would actually reduce journey time and it would also increase capacity, which are the two requirements for high speed too. But it wouldn't cost you 100 billion, it would cost you about 50 million. 
Uh, oh no, it wouldn't it? it would cost you about a million for the app to be honest and a bit of marketing to let people know that the app existed you know but to be honest you could do it for anybody who bought an advanced ticket you go want to go early let us know you know it'd be quite easy the marketing would be quite easy because the the target audience is people who've bought an advanced ticket now the interesting thing about that is once or twice i actually presented that to rail people who became angry okay because their view was that by redefining the problem i was cheating they defined it as an engineering problem which was entirely about end-to-end -end speed the, the train leaving houston the train arriving in manchester that was the point of the part of the journey you had to compress or concertina now my argument was that's the best bit of the whole trip when i'm sitting i tend to buy an advanced first class ticket in defiance of wpp's travel policy okay because my argument is if you allow me to buy a full fare a second class ticket why the hell won't you allow me to buy a cheaper first class ticket that gives me a big table so i can work okay so i ignore that stupid fatuous policy which is moronic and um the interesting thing is once i plonk my ass in seat h9 and i've got the wi-fi working on the laptop out that's the most productive i'm going to be all week okay it's enjoyable it's productive it's useful there is no reason to actually reduce in duration that part of the journey and someone brings you tea and buns as well on the yeah. on the return journey okay well, I mean, that's better than I get at home, right? So it, it is utterly bizarre that we've become obsessed with quantitative optimization simply because it's quantitative and, and numerical. And the subjective side of the equation and the experiential side of the equation, because it's, of course, it's effectively lateral, it's a 90 degree flip, that gets completely overlooked. So you do end up with not only, I think, not only unmet needs, would, you know, which would be things like boarding the train early would be a really nice unmet need. I think you get met unneeds. I think you get billions spent trying to improve an aspect of the journey, which people really don't care about that much. Or, or even actively dislike. I mean, I, I use the West Coast I, line myself and I would pay extra to avoid a pendolino because that rocking technology actually makes it the only train that, that makes me feel nauseous. And but I want to pick up on- I made a joke about that, which is I had three three musical phrases, like, you know, pizzicato, uh, sforzando, and the third one, sforzando was, you know, rising to a loud crescendo, and pendolino meant swayingly with a slight sickening motion. Uh, there yeah. is a tip, pendolino tip here for all the listeners, so you can't go away empty-handed which is, I think if you sit at the middle of the train, it's better than if you sit at the middle of the carriage, it's better than if you sit at the end. Yeah, and it's also the mysterious yeah. triple beep mm. is a, a code to staff that we're coming up to a really rocky bit. Um, oh, is it? But, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's Nobody knows what the beep, 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 Oh, it basically says if you're, if you're pushing a trolley, exactly. you better watch out now because, yeah, we're going to have a... Now, I, actually saw, I actually saw one of the most fantastic things in my life, total digression here. But I was on the top deck of a, a 747 um, uh, when a, a food trolley came loose on landing. This is before 9-11. So the food trolley flew down the center aisle and smashed through the door into the cockpit. So I'm one of the very few people on the planet who's seen what a 747 cockpit looks like with all the instruments covered in yogurt, which I can truly say is one of the most surreal. It's like a Salvador <laughs> Dali image. It's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen in my life. And it's interesting, actually, because I happen to know that a 747, the little bubble, um, used to be um, a storage area before it was. A, well, a it was a, it was to allow loading through the, what they thought is they had a panic Boeing. Uh, Boeing, by the way, Welsh name. Do you know this? So the Boeing family came from Germany, where it was B.O. Umlaut I.N.G. OK. And then when they moved to the United States, we didn't have Umlaut. So they replaced the O Umlaut with O.E. But it actually comes from Ab Owen, which is the Welsh son of Owen. And so the original Boeing ancestor was called Ab Owen, or Bowen, as the surname would become in English. That's why you get all those P and B surnames in Welsh. Okay, it's Parry is Ab Harry, uh, Pritchard is Ab Richard, and so on. You see, it's son of, it's the patronymic. Okay, and Boeing, but anyway, sorry, you didn't really want to know about the, uh, the etymology of the Boeing name. But no, they got frightened by supersonic air travel and they thought the future for the 747 might be as a freighter. And therefore, if they created a, um, a thing above the nose, you could nose load really heavy cargo. Mm. And so the purpose of the thing originally was basically so that the thing could serve dual function as a freighter as well as as a passenger plane. And then as it happened, the Concorde 
along with actually, interestingly, the A380 is a very interesting case in point, by the way, of, of the difference between theory and human practice, because the A380 was based around this network theory that the most efficient form of transportation is hub and spoke. And therefore, you'd have A380s going be between major airports, and then feeder airports would feed the major airports with smaller planes, filling up A380s, which would therefore use fewer landing slots. Now, all of that mathematics is absolutely accurate and true if you're transporting freight, OK? Because freight doesn't really care whether it's got to change planes or not. Boeing bet on the 787 rather than the A380 because what they noticed was that although in theory that was absolutely the most efficient way to transport people around through a hub and spoke model, people basically, whenever people could avoid changing planes, they would. People, you know, people are not cargo. That's that's at well, the actually, that's chapter interesting, one of the book. Yeah. Interesting point because you you talk about. I mean, this is a wonderful book in terms of um, passenger experience, and you you construct this. Uh, it turns out Homo economicus has a travelling cousin, Homo transporticus, that's right. which is the the sort of um, the engineering phrase self-loading freight to describe mm. people. And so it's just a, a fascinating way to think about how we can improve customer experience. Because once, but, once you add, the way I always phrase this is, look, there are hard sciences in business and anything else, okay? If you're building a bridge, um, human psychology plays no part in whether that bridge survives an earthquake, whether it survives heavy winds, whether it can carry a certain weight of traffic. Mm. When you paint the lines on the bridge, however, that has a bearing on human behavior. And then you enter the realm of psychology, where, for example, you might want to paint parallel lines to, towards the approach to the bridge, where the parallel line lay, lines get closer together to give people at traveling at constant speed the slightly alarming ex experience that they're actually speeding up, which will then encourage people to slow down on the approach to the bridge. Mm. And so once you enter the realm of human behavior, um, you have to then abandon the kind of Newtonian physics and certainties and reductionism that business people really like because it makes them it makes them look it, it, it creates an inarguable position, you know, OK, it, it avoids ambiguity and you have to enter the ambiguous world of uh, of human response. Mm. One um, question, though, a, a point that you make in the, in the book is that we need to not only improve passenger experience. Um, but we also need to do so in the context of the purpose and impact of travel. I remember yeah. Chris Boardman, the Olympic cyclist, who's now cycling and walking czar for Manchester under Andy Burnham, saying that if you get people cycling, you get them fitter, um, you bring people closer together, you reduce emissions, and you essentially solve air pollution, the climate emergency, the loneliness pandemic, and the well-being pandemic in one go. <laughs> My, my question is, is there a way, you know, what do you think are the most important changes to transport? But, but, by the way, by the way, you made a lovely point there, which I'm going to amplify because it's worth repeating, which is that sometimes an oblique intervention mm. solves more than one problem, whereas a direct intervention actually even sometimes fails to solve the problem it's directed at, but at the most it will solve the problem it's defined to address. So one of the things that I did joking, half jokingly say is that the widespread use of video conferencing since the pandemic and the fact that I think it's a norm that isn't going to go. What we're doing now would have seemed really weird in 2017. OK. Mm -hmm. You know, and someone would have had to book a room above a pub and then a third of the people wouldn't be able to make it and you couldn't record the session. You know, now, and, you know, and, you know, and then there would have been catering to deal with, you know, all that sort of malarkey. OK, now, one of the interesting things I've said about, you know, if we can get wider use of Zoom, you can solve the transport crisis. You can, to some extent, solve the property crisis because people don't live so near, to, need to live so near to their place of work. And you can solve them. You can solve uh, some degree of gender discrimination because it seems to be, you know, the childbearing years which set back women's careers. And it's not because they're not working. It's because they're not visible, actually, to some extent, you know, that that. Um, uh, you, you, can, you, can solve, you can help solve gender inequality. You can also solve the retirement um, crisis. Because my, my thesis is that a lot of people retire not because they want to stop work, because they want to stop commuting, right? You know, actually, you know, a 64-year-old accountant who's got a cottage near a golf course in Portugal, he's still pretty happy doing some accountancy. That's yeah. not his issue. He just doesn't want to get on a train at 7 o'clock in the morning. And so... You know, we can actually solve quite a few problems simultaneously with an oblique intervention 
uh, like, you know, what I call Zoomlandia, you know, the amount of business that transfers from a physical location to a virtual location. And actually, you know, it, 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 I jokingly said it's kind of given Britain a first class rail network at no expense. Because if you remove the worst moments of peak overcrowding, which I mean, a lot, you know, some flexible working isn't just I don't go in on Mondays. It's I do a few Zoom calls and a bit of email in the morning and then I go in at 11 o'clock. You know, now it, you don't need everybody to do that. In fact, you don't want everybody to do that because it would just create a new problem. OK, but if you get 20 percent, it's like half term, right? Half term just reduces the peak of road use and travel. And what you always notice during half term is that actually your journey to work is a bit of a piece of piss. And that's just because 10 percent of it's been stripped off the top. And actually, if we just get 10, 15, 20 percent of people working flexibly, um, then, uh, you know, half the problem is gone. To be honest, if you're speeding on the motorways, you just get 20 percent of people using adaptive cruise control. You're probably not going to get a speeding problem anymore. There are a lot of problems where you don't need everybody to change their behavior. You just need enough people to change their behavior. And I think on, on that, Rory, that, that, you know, sometimes the commute that provides um, a really great transition period for people yeah. between work and home life. Um, it's a period of reflection. It's a period potentially of, of, of well-being. And actually, if we all stay working from home, it's kind of how, how can we recapture what is, is the role um, for us there when we're working from home? Because I think it is a real behavioral shift that. You know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. And, and we, I think we have also messed this up because one of the things I've been fighting against, I suddenly realized I've had lots and lots of meetings at nine o'clock in the morning. OK, now that doesn't sound like a particular burden, but the way I really like to work is I like to work from about 10 in the morning till about six, at which point I'm kind of knackered. OK, and then I can work again from, let's say, 10 p.m. to one in the morning or 11 p.m. till two in the morning which I sometimes do because it's completely quiet. Mm. And the annoying thing is if you have a 9 a.m. meeting, you end up with not enough sleep and then you can't do the extra three hours. So ironically, by starting an hour earlier, you you kind of lose two hours of work. Oh, Rory. Visible during, sorry, yeah. There, there was a temporary freeze. That's oh, it. sorry. What, what became apparent during the pandemic by looking at people's at VPN use uh, was that people started work earlier they finished work later, but they took a longer break in the middle. Mm -hmm. And that would, by the way, seem to be a desirable thing because, you know, for four months of the year or five months of the year, uh, if you work conventionally, you're deprived of daylight, you know, completely. Yeah. You know, I mean, imagine if you work in Sweden or, or, Nor or Oslo or somewhere like that, okay? Right? I mean, for about three or four months of the year, you go to work in the dark and you go home in the dark. And the daylight for five days of your seven is actually spent uh, in completely unpropitious circumstances in an artificially lit office. So, I mean, we, we I, I also think we can reinvent, it'll take time. By the way, I think we would have got to this level of Zoom use anyway, without the pandemic. I think it would have taken 10 more years, at least. Just for habits to get, new habits to become aligned without the kind of simultaneous um, impetus that drove everybody to try it. And then after a month realized that it actually worked surprisingly well. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, I, I think it is, I, I think there's a whole lot of stuff to reinvent here still on the back of this. And we're stupidly talking about the bloody metaverse when to be honest, we should be talking about what we do in response to remote and flexible working and how we can improve productivity. One of the things I've said with Zoom meetings is look, um, actually, when you have a Zoom meeting with somebody, a really sensible thing to do would be to block two meetings in your diary. And then if you're too busy or you're feeling stressed or you're not in the mood for the first meeting, you just contact the person and say, is it all right if we just slip to meeting slot two? Now, you couldn't do that in the physical world because the poor sod, you know, was traveling over to see you, right? Yes. You know, equally, you couldn't have 10 minute meetings in the physical world. I always found this when we were in Canary Wharf as Ogilvy, it was a pain in the ass because you couldn't meet anybody for half an hour because if they'd traveled to Canary Wharf, you owed them at least an hour of your time to compensate them for the bloody journey. Yeah. And if someone traveled to Canary Wharf to see you and you just said, I love your book, it's fantastic, you need to fix a meeting with this creative director, okay? You could deal with that in 10 minutes, but you couldn't. You had to talk to them for another 50 minutes because otherwise you felt like a complete arsehole 
making them spend you know 80 minutes on a tube for 10 minutes of your time mm -hmm. and yet on zoom we can do those micro meetings but we still haven't done it we've allowed the hour to become the, the, the that's carried over as the default for the duration of a meeting good tip by the way paul dolan uh, behavioral science guru at the london school of economics um, the correct ratio of homework and office work is go into the office one day more per week than you would if left to your own devices. Because we generally default to lazy and we're not very good yes. hedonic forecasters. And if you force yourself, if you just nudge yourself over the line on one day of the week, you'll probably end up enjoying it, if you can. Okay, so don't necessarily just go completely with your own instincts. In the old days, you kind of had to nudge yourself or seek permission to work from home. You know, it required, you know, a certain degree of pain mm. and friction. Yeah. In the new world, I think it, it, we need to slightly recalibrate in the other direction. I'm, I'm absolutely not one of those Luddites who says, no, I want everybody back in the office. But I think there probably is scope to nudge people. Certainly the one day a week crowd could probably nudge it up to two. Speaking of, of sort of nudge and, and behaviour change, and obviously we're going to have to get really good at this psychological approach if we want to in, enrol people in more sustainable modes of transport as part of more sustainable... Okay, okay here's a great phrase from the car industry. The best part is no part, OK? If you can design a car so it doesn't need a car part in the first place, no part costs nothing and it can't go wrong. The most sustainable form of travel is no travel by the way. Yes, and, and actually, I, I, I wonder about that. I mean, I'm going to throw two questions at you at once, I think, as a result. So, so question one is, has the sort of evolutionary science approach agenda been hijacked by the concept of behaviour change, which to me, it always feels a bit psychopathic that if you're going to invest in understanding human evolution and what makes a human work well, simply reducing it to how do we get people to undertake the behaviour that we've already determined for them seems a bit reductionist versus... No, no, no. By the way, I buy you. I buy that. I, I think defining what you think is optimal for somebody else yeah. without full knowledge of their circumstances and their preferences uh, is a dangerous use of nudge theory. Um, it's, it's what you might call the normative use of nudge theory. We think it's economically rational for 23 year olds to save money in a pension. Therefore, we're going to spend a lot of time kind of bullying them to do it. On the other hand, if you simply make it easier for those 25 year olds who want a pension to sign up, OK, I think that's defensible. OK, because if you think how easy it is to spend 50 quid uh, on a pair of jeans or an online purchase compared to how easy it is to put 50 pounds into a pension scheme. OK, it's not unreasonable to suggest there's an asymmetry there. OK, but at the same time, do not say do not keep incentivizing pensions to the extent where you demand 20 because 24 year olds are probably focused on a lot of other things like finding a partner. OK where a pension probably isn't the optimal way to spend your money. Because as I've said, I, I'm fairly sure I don't know anything about it. <coughs> but if you go on Tinder, I don't think there are many 25 year olds talking about their pension provision. There are probably a load of 75 year old blokes who are talking quite a lot about their pension. Um, but I don't think there are many 25 year old blokes. And that may be simply because of evolutionary reasons. We're not particularly primed to save um, uh, in the early years of our life, because there are other more important things to signal or to demonstrate. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, going with the flow. And, and, and I, I think you're you also, I think there are other cases, by the way, where all I think the role of nudging is simply to remove asymmetries in people's decision making. So if you haven't traveled by train for 10 years, OK, um, the first train journey you take will be a cognitive nightmare compared to getting in the car and driving there because you've got a totally familiar thing that you know exactly how it works. And then you've got a totally unfamiliar system where you don't know where to park. You don't know where to buy a ticket. You don't know where the trains go. So incentivizing people to take three or four train journeys in a year. OK, or encouraging them to do it. I've often said that you make the car tax disc 100 pounds higher but you give everybody £150 worth of non-transferable rail vouchers um, that they can, spend, they can spend the extra money on. So that next time you go to Manchester from Seven Oaks, OK, instead of going, right, we'll just get in the car and go to Manchester. If you've had two or three train journeys over the last year, you will at least make an informed decision 
do I take the train or do I drive? You may end up driving because you've got a whole load of luggage to take or you've got young kids or whatever it might be. There are lots of reasons why you might want to drive or because you're going for two weeks. OK, you may still drive, but at least you're making a decision based on equal information about both alternatives. Whereas at the moment, there's a whole uh, there's a whole swathe of the population who count themselves rail rejectors who basically just wouldn't get on a train if you put a gun to their head. And I think, you know, I think there are cases where it's the car does enjoy, by the way, the car. In, I, I'm very pro car, much more so than Pete, because Pete doesn't have a car. And I've got an electric car, which is actually a very nice car to drive. Um, but I'm very, I'm actually much more pro car than Pete. But I do accept the fact that by dint of sitting outside your house and waiting for you 24 hours a day, you're you are biased towards car journeys in a way that you wouldn't be if people were in a parallel universe where people were forced to keep their cars 500 yards away from home. Mm. Uh, people would make more bus journeys, more journeys on foot, and they'd cycle more. The fact that you have a car straight outside your house, it's the first thing you come to. You, you said that sometimes the, the best solution is not to have a solution. And I guess, you know, the most sustainable form of transport and the best for our well-being is probably simply to go through, for a walk in the woods. Yeah. Uh, but I wonder, you know, I, I wonder what the bottleneck is, because in a sense, when I first met you, Rory, behaviour change, in a sense, was in its infancy, uh, whereas now, you know, words like nudge, virtue signalling, loss aversion, when they appear in the media, they don't even get an explanation because people have become familiar with them. And I wonder if the, the limiting factor now is less how do we change behaviours and more what are the business models that incentivize that to happen in the first place, because in a sense, you know, if the healthiest travel is a walk in the woods uh, in enterprise, if you don't want to go and live in a commune, but you also don't want to charge people to make life worse, you have a bit of a, 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 a bit of a problem. So how do we um, create I, business models that I actually think, promote sustainability? I think what happens, OK, and this is really interesting, and this is a wider problem, is that if you look at how consumers make decisions, they probably look at the same purchase through a variety of different lenses and they factor in some things which are numerical the car's miles per gallon its relative fuel economy some things which are emotional number of cup holders you know um some things which are aesthetic some things which are subjective you know does this brand suit my projection of my personality okay and they manage somehow internally to come up with a solution which is at least tolerable across 10 or 15 dimensions we don't know how it works, but it's obviously quite a clever and sophisticated mechanism because most people don't regret their decisions. Um, now, admittedly, we're slightly wired not to regret our decisions, but, but I'll park, park that for a moment. When you have people in an institutional setting, they tend to default to one way of looking at the world. And it tends to be a little bit of a lowest common denominator because the model you need to use is the model that's most readily understood by all the other people in the room. And the best model, therefore, to use is the one that's most likely to be comprehensible to them. And so, you know, in transport discussions, we've we've got instead of any any journey is a hugely nuanced decision. Right. Actually. Um, so if you know if I'm how do I get to Gatwick Airport? Well, it depends how much luggage I have, um, how long I'm planning to stay for, because if you're planning to go for three weeks, a taxi is cheaper than parking. If you're going for two nights, other way around, you know, you probably drive. OK, whether it's raining, whether you've got kids. And then even if I decide to drive to Gatwick, weirdly, I might not choose the fastest route. I might choose the route with the lowest variance. So I might go on back roads because although it's 20 minutes slower on average, if the M25 gets stuck because a, a truck jackknifes at Clackett Lane, I'll miss my plane. Whereas whatever happens on the A25, I'll probably be able to turn off down some side road and escape the disaster. You know, I'll get there in time somehow. OK, so there are all these incredibly sophisticated things going on that enable us to make a decision about a journey. Um, and, you know, and actually what we tend to do when we talk, when we have to convince other people is oddly we we, we make we make the decision look more scientific because it's a stronger argument but the price we pay is we actually make the consideration set much less nuanced 
And we tend to go in with very, very simple models, which are readily comprehensible to everybody. And all groups and all professional groups tend to become fixated on a particular view of the world. But I think what's really important, and this is, this is why the marketing view, this is why I think Ritson's point about marketing and the 90 degree, 90 degree flip is so important, because as marketers, you know, our real value isn't that we're fantastically clever or creative or whatever. It's just that we look at things from a different angle. And, you know, depending on who you're talking to, uh, you know, preferences will change, circumstances change. There are all these factors at work in terms of forming a decision. And taking a very simplistic model of what people are trying to do, which generally is, you know, get from A to B as fast as possible, which is not necessarily what they're trying to do at all, by the way. You know, there are all kinds of reasons why we travel, some of them being for the journey itself. Um, you know, so I mean, you know, nobody boasts about how fast a cruise ship is, because the whole point about a cruise ship is it's enjoyable being on board. Um, and so this oversimplified thing is often something that appears when you have institutional decision making. And I always, we always sort of believe that, you know, business to business decision making is extremely rational and hard, hard headed, whereas consumer decision making is unbelievably irrational and emotional. But actually, the consumer decision making is more subtle and more nuanced than the B2B decision making is by a long way, because you're allowed to factor in things that you can't quantify. Mm. We've become quite sort of prominent in marketing at having an individual relationship with consumers. Uh, I hate using that word, actually, but but in a sense, you've argued for us being the group that understands the individual journey in this case. And that's yeah. really important. However, I just want to challenge that a little bit because you also um, a, a couple of things. Firstly, are, are we entering an environment where actually um the most interesting businesses in sustainability for example aren't necessarily doing a lot of consumer marketing they're, they're in a stakeholder environment well, well here, here's an interesting question which is nobody has designed a framework for sustainable behavior which is which acknowledges individual difference between individual actors and enables everybody to make a contribution towards environmental sustainability in their own different way. Mm. Okay, so if you, economics uses the single representative agent, okay, and by the way, the extent to which the, the representative agent colors our thinking. So what do you need someone to do in order to produce sustainable behavior? And it would be reduce, you know, car use by X percent, okay? don't do this, don't do that, adopt a plant, you know, plant only diet, you know, um, you know, don't use electricity for pointless things, da, 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 da. And so what it then says is, okay, everybody has to do that. Okay. Now, everybody finds themselves in completely different circumstances. And one, everybody can't do that. Some people can do more of what you ask, and some people can do less, depending on what you're asking them to do. And not everybody wants to do everything forever. Okay. So, <laughs> If you went to me, and this is just a thesis, and I'm, I'm continually burbling on about this, and I need someone with the expertise in energy knowledge to help us out on this as marketers. If you went and said, here are 10 big things you can do, here are 10 medium-sized things you can do, and here are 10 small things you can do, okay? We want you to take three from each list and pledge to do three of them for one year only. Now, I would probably pledge not to fly in 20. I can't pledge never to fly ever again. I've got a job, right? You know, I can't just say to everybody, I'm never going to fly ever again, right? But I could say I've made a climate pledge not to, ple not to fly in 2023, okay? I can't not buy clothes ever again in my life, but I could pledge not to buy clothes in 2024, not to buy any new clothing items at all, okay? I could pledge, you know, there are, you know, I could pledge to, you know, always put my washing machine on at 10 o'clock at night rather than at six o'clock. You know, that that definitely comes under the small, not the big category, you know. Um, but the point I'm making is that if anybody, nobody has actually tried to actually create a template for environmentally sustainable behavior, where instead of asking everybody to do everything all the time, you ask everybody to do something some of the time. Mm. And by the way, that would also be fair because poorer people would say, well, I'm not flying anyway because I can't afford to, you know, and I don't travel more than 5,000 miles a year by car because I haven't got a car, right? Mm. And the poorer people, and that's, by the way, perfectly fair because anybody poorer has a lower carbon footprint to begin with. So they should be able to tick a few of those boxes day one. Mm. 
right? Mm -hmm. Whereas it's richer people who need to change their behavior more. And you could design something which was universally agreed to be free, to be fair, and which people pledge to support. And then you give them a car sticker or something, right? To stick on their presumably electric car. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, but instead, nobody has, designed, nobody has actually said, as an individual, what can you do? Because they either tell you, it's exactly the same as dietary advice, okay? Instead of saying, look, for any given person, you know, let's say your risk is diabetes or your risk might be, uh, for example, um, cardiovascular or whatever. It varies per person. Okay, focus on this one thing. Don't worry too much about the other things. The problem with health advice is if you read the Daily Mail, effectively, everything you eat could be bad for you. And when we're presented with a too big and too vague an ask, we get blinded by the headlights and our reaction, our instinctive reaction is to do nothing at all. And there are loads of things I could do. Just give me a framework, a choice framework, in which I can meaningfully make decisions about where I'd like to commit and where I'd rather not. I mean, a famous case, okay, Caroline Lucas, who's the head of the Green Party, once a year flies to New York. Everybody goes, that's disgusting. You know, she's the head of the Green Party and she's on a plane to New York. Her son lives in New York, okay? Now, with the best will in the world, okay, you can't expect someone not to see their own child ever again because they're unwilling for either Caroline or her son to board an aircraft once a year. Yeah. Okay, that, that simply ridiculous us. So instead of that, you ask Caroline to do something else. You know, like actually sort out Brighton's bloody electric car charging, which is bloody rub. I mean, that's a really funny thing, by the way. Okay. Um, if you want to know the difference between what you might call virtue signaling and actual virtue, you go to Oxford, you go to Cambridge, you go to Brighton, right? Which are the wokest places in Britain. And the car charging facilities there, the electric car charging facilities are bloody disaster. There's nothing. Okay. And you go to somewhere, <laughs> you go to somewhere which you wouldn't associate with that kind of thing, like Hemel Hempstead or Cribs Causeway in Bristol. And it's fantastic. It is worth noting that the people who make the noise in this debate aren't necessarily the people who are actually adopting the actions. And that's another important point, by the way. You know, if you can get people to adopt environmentally friendly behaviour for other reasons other than self-sacrifice, i.e. because electric cars are great to drive, you know, mm. um, don't worry about that. That's fine. Mm. You know, perfectly fine. We not Because there's a huge tendency to want to signal that you care okay um, and that means you tackle the problem head on and you probably do some very visible things okay now i'm just just to give an example you know the, the debate about refugees at the moment okay actually the best thing you can do now not necessarily in a month's time not necessarily in two months time but the people who really need help need help to the extent to which they're either in the country still or they're re they're recently exited and they have nowhere to go and actually campaigning to spend money on those people now is a better use of resources than, you know, because the people who are already in France are undoubtedly deserving. By the way, everybody with a family connection, I think as many people as we can take proportionately, we should take. I'm not, I'm not being an anti-refugee person. I'm just saying that talking about refugees is a very good way to signal that you care. And it's a very good way to look non-racist and stuff, right? Okay. It makes you look good, but it may not be actually where you need to tackle the problem right now. And actually, you know, funding a family in Poland with money might be a better thing to do. Now, I, I, by the way, I'm not confident I'm right. The, the, the Norwegians did work on this and they said that actually it was 14 times more effective to actually help people as soon as they'd escaped from a country. At that point was when the most help was needed and you could make the most difference rather than allowing someone into Norway, where to some extent they, you know, th those were perhaps the people, uh, people with family connections in particular were probably the people who were probably richer by origins and, and least urgently in need of help. You um you quote Amartya Sen, the development economist in in Transport for Humans, and of course his whole lens is that in development you should work to enhance people's own agency. Um, and my sense is that that is incredibly important in any refugee crisis. That um, I think there is a a bad error of framing um, where we rightly draw the distinction between an economic migrant and a refugee. An economic migrant is seeking a better life. I mean, I've done it, I've moved to Paris, I've moved to Madrid. It's a good thing, but it's a different thing. But I also believe that um, 
I think when somebody is a refugee and is fleeing a natural disaster or a conflict, they shouldn't lose the, we shouldn't think that they are no longer refugees once they are technically safe somewhere. No, no, no. Uh, because in that situation, I mean, you do hear politicians who say that somebody <coughs> who was stuck in the Calais jungle, who is technically legally considered to be safe, although they're probably a victim of crime every day. Uh, um, they are. Uh, uh, um, they're, they're, actually, well, they're actually a victim of the French police, but um, I've, I've got friends who go and work there and... Um, yeah, it, it, it's not it's not necessarily safe. Now, That's a very fair for, definition. For a refugee, um, they need to. They obviously have a desire to rebuild their life in the place where they are best able to contribute and to rebuild their lives. And I think it is really important that we frame a refugee. If we're thinking of journeys today in our conversation, that a refugee remains a refugee throughout their journey to a better life, um, and we don't discount them. Uh, as non-refugees if they happen to be temporarily safe in a place where they don't speak the language and um, they're not able to contribute um, to a productive uh, productively to themselves and, and each other. I mean it now, might it might be that a hundred pounds of aid goes four times far further in Poland in terms of providing housing yeah. and that's where it's more not that's not necessarily where it's more important it's where it's more immediately needed and I always think there's there, there is there is an important thing in anything that is pro-social or um, uh, uh, and by the way, totally well intentioned, but the, the need to signal that you care mm. sometimes outweighs the actual value of making a difference. Yeah. Now, um, because because, because, because sometimes the thing that makes a difference can be surprisingly, you know, banal or boring. Well, yeah. And the speed, you're absolutely right about the speed, too. Absolutely true about that. Uh, yeah. Speaking of making a difference, though, we're going to take a short pause. Um, we'll also uh, just, just a, a seriously important point here, which is one thing you've got to watch in any charitable organization um, is that well intentioned activities tend to we tend to self scrutinize much less mm -hmm. than other activities. So we tend to go, well, I've got the nice good feeling because I've done something good and I've made a sacrifice. So this sounds a really harsh thing to say, but you actually have to be quite tough with people who work with charities because they will quite often declare success. There have been various water charities which go in and they provide piping. If you go back to the village a year later, the whole thing's totally dysfunctional. Um, and the, the people who previously made a living selling water have trashed the pipe. You know. But as far as they're concerned, they had a wonderful success because you know they've all worked together to build this pipe. Mm. And it's... The, the thing is, it, it sits really unpleasantly on the human mind and it makes you look like an asshole going into charitable and well-intentioned organisations with the mindset of a cynic. Mm. But you probably have to do a bit of that. And there's an interesting thing called the effective altruism movement, mm. uh, which sort of investigates this. And there are also things, I mean, there's a wonderful book I recommend called The Elephant in the Brain by Kevin Simler and um, who's the other guy? I'll remember it in a second. Robin Hansen, uh, where he says that, you know, we probably actually have a disproportionate um, urge to treat the sick. OK, so, so that one of the things now, this is not necessarily the case in the UK where we, you know, we spend possibly too little on health, but we're certainly fairly sparing. OK, but in countries, one of the things you notice is that in countries which spend a huge amount on health, uh, life expectancy does not improve. It gets worse, possibly because of over intervention. And you know, there are all sorts of reasons for that bias, yeah. which is that it feels like you to say, actually, let's just see if this gets better of its own accord or you probably don't need an operation right now feels wrong. Mm. And that may actually distort judgment. So there is there is such a thing as pathological altruism. Mm. Um, and it's very it's very difficult for us to get our heads around this because we tend to conflate the purity of an intention with the um, desirability of the outcome. And, and, and by the way, I might be talking total bollocks on this question of whether money is better spent in Poland or better spent here. I, I might be entirely wrong. All I'm saying is we need to ask that question. Yeah. How, super, is the, yeah how is the money best spent now? Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in the case of Syria, for example, so many people who fled 
bypass the humanitarian system altogether because what was important is what could they do with their lives and if yeah. being in a refugee camp was not an answer to that question then um that part of humanitarian activity wasn't wasn't relevant to their needs now we do need to take a a brief pause before we continue because speaking of taking action not only do we have a, a marketing kind member as our guest for the exchange but also our members will know that we have a Coffee with the Cause on the last Friday of every month, 11 to 12.30. And this month's Coffee with the Cause is with also with one of our members. It's with um, Joel Barnett, who previously raised £100,000 actually for um, NHS charities together, as it happens, um, mm -hmm. uh, through the, the book ex ex Excerpts from Experts, which I, I think had a number of Marketing Kind members contribute essays to. Um, and this time, Joel is back uh, with an even bigger plan um, to support both the NHS and now um, the Disasters and Emergencies Committee's appeal that I mentioned in the introduction. So, Joel, could you tell us a little bit about your plan and how we may be able to help? Absolutely. So, um, as Paul rightly said, uh, last year we united the marketing community to raise money for the heroic staff working in the NHS during the COVID uh, pandemic. We we produced this book. Um, Rory, you'll recognise that because yeah. you're, you're prominently in it. Um, and uh, uh, and we did very well. But and, and we are exceptionally proud of what this profession, uh, well, this community achieved, um, but we are utterly committed to going so much further and having an even greater impact as a community this year. And so with this year's charity initiative, uh, as, as Paul said, we're, we're gonna again leverage the marketing community's generosity, its creativity, its unity and its expertise to raise at least 300,000 pounds, 200,000 which, of which will go to the humanitarian crisis in the Ukraine, uh, specifically uh, the Disasters Emergency Committee, Ukrainian Humanitarian Appeal, and a further £100,000 for um, NHS charities together. And additionally, we want uh, brands um, to uh, support their own charity partners through this initiative as well. So hopefully, as a community, we'll raise masses more. And we're going to do it this time by persuading brands to make donations in the form of goods or experiences. Ideally, these will be money can't buy prizes. So I'll give you an example. We've got uh, one unbelievably generous brand who has offered to uh, uh, effectively uh, give us the prize of being flown onto the track at Silverstone for the Grand Prix, being driven around at a ghost lap uh, um, in a car and then uh, by, by a Formula One team member and then watching the race uh, uh, from a seat in the paddock. Um, so as you can see, kind of thing that hopefully will generate a lot of attention. And consumers then make a donation and that donation then enters them into a prize draw. And one can enter uh, uh, into as many draws as they like, as many times as they wish. We're anticipating that we'll do uh, about four draws a month, so four brand offers a month throughout the entirety of uh, 2022. And next Friday, uh, March 25th at 11 o'clock, we are inviting you to uh, join us, to lend us uh, your creativity, your connectivity, your energy expertise, or just your moral support um, to make this initiative a, a massive success. Because we are time and resource constrained, uh, we will be relying quite heavily on the support of the wonderful members of uh, Marketing Kind to help us plan and execute this initiative. Um, and, and indeed, uh, I believe, Paul, this session's open to non-members as well. Currently, is in this, this one here, not, not the copy with the cause. That's right. Yes. So if anybody uh, is a non-member and is interested in getting involved, firstly, I suggest you just join Marketing Kind uh, because it is a wonderful organisation. Um, uh, but but feel, do also feel free to uh, to just drop me a, a note or ping me through LinkedIn. Um, I hope to see you next Friday at eleven. That's wonderful, and uh, I, 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 wonderful also that that Formula One uh, auction offer also chimes so nicely with the the theming the, the theme of journeys that we have today. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes it comes together without even. Um, intentionality amazing, huh? um, but that is wonderful so to remind everyone all marketing kind members march 25th 
um, 11 o'clock to 12.30 and we'll be working with Joel. Um, if you're not a Marketing Kind member, then as Joel says, it's, there's still time to correct that. Um, and if you're not a Marketing Kind member and can't become one, but have some other brilliant ideas or offers of support for Joel, contact Joel or, or get in touch with us and we will introduce you. Um, so uh, definitely, I encourage, encourage everyone. I think that's going to be quite a journey in its own right. Um, I also want to say this is a, a moment when um, I want to plug uh, Transport for Humans. It's not only had uh, Rory's characteristic wit and insight, but of course we should pay tribute to uh, Pete Dyson, whose yeah. work we've also appreciated at Marketing Kind through the partnership with the Ogilvy Summer School and our volunteering platform. So we've had many opportunities to uh, appreciate Pete's uh, brilliant work. Uh, of course, people may, I imagine everybody in our community has read Alchemy by now, but if you haven't, then um, please do so. I actually am most familiar with you, Rory, uh, with your writing through the Spectator column that I read every second Saturday in a local cafe. Uh, and I recommend this only to people who don't mind being caught laughing out loud in public with no obvious external uh, cause. Uh, so if that's not you, then um, treat with caution. Um, we're going to filter in some questions through the Q&A um, well and I recommend to keep questions short to make it easier for us to pick them out. Um, and just to get us going though, Rory, I want to, you know, you close Transport for Humans with a beautiful invocation of the need um, for us to all experience an overview effect. And I think that kind of gets to the heart of moving beyond sort of consumerism to thinking in a more inclusive stakeholder way of, of how do we create good that reaches beyond in-group versus out-group, that versus beyond uh, the sort of uh, private benefit, collective cost, collective benefit, private cost problem. So what would be your tip for cultivating uh, a, an overview mindset in all of us? Well, I think there's an interesting question, which is there is a scale which is appropriate at which to solve problems. And one of the problems that happens in siloed businesses is most employees are only licensed to operate at a particular scale within a particular silo. Hmm. And one thing I've noticed since the book came out, for example, is that sometimes you have a problem which is not solvable at the brand level. It's only solvable at the category level. So I've, I've been talking quite a lot about this recently, which is with electric cars, okay, they tend to compete on, on range because range is the big anxiety. And so, you, you know, brand Kia will say, you know, 20 miles more range than the Tesla this or whatever it may be. Now, at an individual brand level, that kind of makes sense if what you want is uh, market share. But if you want the category to grow, the, the net effect of all this competition over range is to continually emphasize what is probably the only significant negative to owning an electric car. OK, and my argument is that interestingly, OK, actually, range anxiety is perfectly relevant and perfectly intelligent in the United States or Canada or even Australia. OK, or countries which are what we call in technical terms, very, very big. OK, particularly countries where you, you know, your parents might live 500 miles away from you and you have to drive through effectively an uninhabited wasteland to go and see them. OK, um, there are about 15 reasons why range anxiety is more or less irrelevant in the UK and the Netherlands, certainly irrelevant in Singapore, where you'd have to drive around the island seven or eight times just to get close to running out of you know, a, a full charge. OK. And so this worry has translated itself into situations where it really doesn't apply. So in the UK, in a year's time, there'll be enough rapid chargers. Nobody will need to worry that much. That's the first thing. Um, secondly, we don't get extreme low temperatures. Thirdly, there's a big difference between stopping in the middle of Bolton on the water for half an hour to charge your car and having a shifty around the shops versus being stuck at a Nebraska truck stop in sub-zero temperatures while your car charges. You know, we don't. Um, fourthly, our homes have, even if you go and visit your granny, OK, um, uh, basically our homes have 240 volts, not 110. So even if you just have to charge to an ordinary domestic three pin plug, it's OK. Right. And I can list I can list about, you know, I can list about nine other reasons. You know, we don't travel on hu huge distances. 
we have trains as an alternative. I wouldn't drive to Manchester for the day anyway. I'd take a train. Okay. Now in America, there are lots of cases where it's extremely cold. You have to drive 350 miles to go and visit someone through a desert or through some uninhabited wasteland where there is only one rapid charger on route, which might be out of action or already occupied when you arrive. Okay. That is a completely different um, scale of problem to the problem in the UK. I'll, I'll give you the maths. Okay. This is a scale question. Okay. The more densely populated you are, the fewer gas stations you need per person. Um, in the UK, we've got eight and a half thousand petrol stations. Uh, the United States has 116,000. OK, so providing charger infrastructure for the UK is comparatively easy, whereas in the US, it's a significant challenge still. Uh, and by the way, I mean, that also means, I mean, I think that also means there are ideas which we shouldn't wait for the Americans to pioneer ideas. The Dutch are pioneering for e-commerce, a locker system, because they've realized in a very small, densely populated country, you only need about 10,000 lockers nationwide to make everybody, if not quite in walking distance of a locker, they're at least within, you know, totally convenient trip to a locker which would make e-commerce delivery inordinately cheaper, but much more environmentally sustainable because it's the last mile that's the problem in e-commerce. Um, you know, distributing things to 20,000 points is actually comparatively a trivial problem for a distribution company. On the other hand, 22 million households poses problems because you've only got to have one delivery to a remote farmhouse and that's your delivery van out of action for an hour and a half, you see. And so, so, you know, there are whole things where the, 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 we have to accept the fact that there's a scale at which to intervene. And, you know, what's appropriate depends on the scale of intervention. I think there are some things where we're probably uh, we're probably trying to solve too many problems in the middle. And you either need to go to the top and say, OK, you know, this is effectively one universal action we could take. My joke, what I suggested today was that if you want to be a member of parliament, you're forced to buy seaside property. Um, that would make people, you know, pretty alert to climate change if you had a substantial investment in beachfront property. OK, but I mean, what I'm saying is you can either do sort of big heuristic things at the top or at the same time, you've got to look at the level of individual experience. Hmm. And quite often, I think we get stuck between the two. And this is, I think, the, what, what's wonderful about the 90 degree flip, as Mark calls it, you know, that we have we, we do as marketers. We mustn't forget this. We have this superpower, which is to say, I mean, could you, interesting question, rather than accepting 350 pounds to house someone, could we form, could, could any of us on this Zoom call form a group of five, 10 people who all club together to fund a Polish family, to host a family closer to the point of exit, mm -hmm for 350 pounds a month. Now, that goes a lot further in Poland than it does here. I was, I made the suggestion in the presence of a South African, and the South African said, in South Africa, 350 pounds a month is a lottery win, right? Okay, so the, the, the point I'm making is, you know, there are enormous new possibilities, I think, for voluntary bottom-up human collaboration. Mm. I, think, I think Zoom is the most important. Uh, weirdly, it wasn't the technological development of Zoom, uh, Absolutely not. It was actually the normalization of the use of video calling um, mm. through the pandemic. I think that's one of the most important things economically, um, which we'll see, you know, in, in the decade easily, maybe even longer. Mm. Obviously, not as important as the Internet, because it's kind of part of the Internet. But actually, I think we're vastly understating the extent to which the ability to meet sort of face to face mm. um, at short notice globally in any community of interest you want to form um, and the, the ability to deliver value not you know uh, effectively in short bursts um, uh, 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 the ability by the way you know we can call in any expert you know, for this group of people you know if you if you wanted to get a Nobel Prize winning economist in to talk to this group well you'd, you'd have to wait a, you might have to wait six months but you get somebody right that's that's like a superpower. You know, previously it would have required two business class flights across the Atlantic and it would have taken four years. Mm. And I, I think this, the, the we, we vastly under, the exchange of ideas, the speed of the exchange of ideas, apart from anything else, very boring fact, okay? Nobody notices. We can talk 10 times faster than we type. Okay. 
okay. Um, but the speed of the exchange of ideas globally here that's been made possible, everybody seems to be kind of brushing this off. And I don't, I genuinely don't get it. Like, uh, this is extraordinary. This is genuinely magical. And it, um, there's a paper actually, have a look at it. It's by a guy called Noah Smith and it's called Distributed Service Sector Productivity. And he predicts what you might call a Zoom boom, which is the use of video conferencing, now once universally adopted, should lead to a surge in economic productivity and service businesses, which is really, really interesting. Rory, can I give, um, I'm going to bring in a question um, from our audience. So it's a question from Claudia. So she's sticking on the theme um, of journeys, but rather looking at consumer journeys. So how can behavioral science be used to improve the user's experience across key moments of the consumer journey, especially around the point of conversion? As I said, um, one of the things you can do is you realize that one market research and conventional economic rationality on their own aren't enough. And if you marry behavioral science to data and measurement on the one hand and creativity on the other, it just massively increases your solution space. Because now the price you pay is it creates ambiguity, which a lot of your colleagues won't like. And that's why they find marketing annoying, because, because marketing is of necessity ambiguous. But once you admit psychological solutions into the mix, alongside technological uh, or logistical solutions, your solution space becomes much, much bigger. The example, I hate to do this because everybody's heard me say it before. The example I always give is, if you'd ask a load of people, what do you want from a taxi firm? They'd say, I want the taxis to turn up really quickly. Now, Uber didn't do that. What it did is it created a map, which didn't make the taxis turn up any sooner, but massively reduced the emotional anxiety you experienced waiting for a cab because you could see where it was and you could see that it was on its way and you knew what its license plate number was and so on. Okay. And that's what my that's my example of a psychological solution, which is you've defined the problem in SI units. OK, how what is the average wait time for a taxi? OK, and that's an expensive problem to solve. But if you say, how can you make the time spent waiting for a taxi be high quality time rather than low quality time? Uber solves that problem completely because you go, oh, look, he's stuck in those traffic lights. I'll have another pint. Right. You know, instead of going, oh, God, where, where's my taxi? I'm sorry, I can't get into conversation with this person because my taxi could turn up at any minute. You know, oh, God, maybe he can't find the house and he's parked around the corner. OK, you know, there's even a bit of ego involved, OK, which is, you know, I, I always apologise for this because it does make me sound a bit naff. But I don't know, but so, some of the people on the call will do this, which is you time your departure from the building to coincide exactly with the moment the car draws up because it makes you feel Watching like... The map. <laughs> yeah, watching the map, because so, you feel a bit like Kaiser Soze at the end of The Usual Suspects, you know. I do that with Amazon packages. <laughs> with Amazon packages, well, you watch them, you watch them, you go I'm out watching. of the door. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, funny you say that, but actually I do the same thing. If, I, if I'm actually tracking the delivery guy, I'll open the gate in advance mm -hmm. and I'll actually be standing out there because it feels like a different kind of exchange from the mm. buzzing on the doorbell thing. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely fair. Yeah. yeah. Uh, package Sorry. tracking, of course, is a kind of vicarious travel, isn't it? Yeah. I sort of um, recommend something in, at the end of Alchemy, which I think is wonderful. It's sort of your take on 20% time, which is to spend 20% of your time thinking through actually, rather than what we think, you know, why is something the way that it is? Mm -hmm. And therefore, how can we re reframe things to get a better outcome? And just as a, a last question, uh, potentially last question. Well, I'll tell you a lovely story, by the way, about behavioral science of transport, which is that the wait for boarding a plane is ruined because people know where the gate is. And they feel driven by this primal force. Once five people form a queue at the gate, everybody is forced to join this queue at the gate which means that instead of spending their weight to board the plane, drinking coffee and reading the newspaper, they're standing in a row to try and blag their early boarding point. Mm. Okay. Dallas Fort Worth airport is designing gates. So there is ambiguity as to where you might board the plane so that a queue can't fall. Mm. I mean, that's, that's the kind of, you know, so it's often, often the question is you do the 90 degree flip and then you ask the question qualitatively and subjectively rather than objectively. Mm -hmm. As soon as you hear someone use an objective measure, be suspicious, because how well, given that we don't perceive the world objectively anyway, our evolution has not given us senses that are like 
um, scientific sensors, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, the temperature, how we perceive temperature, okay, is highly, you know, it feels like those American weather forecasts. It depends on humidity, it depends on the breeze, it depends on a variety of factors. By the way, a really important point, actually, which is the environmental movement is always talking about rising temperatures. Mm -hmm. What actually matters is not rising temperatures, it's rising wet bulb temperatures. And that's a diff that's a measure of temperature which accounts for the cooling effect of evaporation. Mm. If you're going to hide it, if anybody's been to Phoenix, Arizona, or been to Death Valley, or anywhere really dry or the desert, okay, even if you're a you know fat Celt like me, you can I can wander around in hundred degree heat in Phoenix. I'm pretty happy, okay. If it's ninety degrees in London, I don't even go to work because I it's just I can't function, right? And the part so the point I'm making here is that um, actually. You know, that's a really important point, because if the wet bulb temperature of a large part of the Earth goes up, you create areas which, are, although not that hot in objective terms, are uninhabitable. And so you know, th this is the point, which is that nearly all measures are designed for scientific calculation. They're not designed for human perception. Yeah. And actually, what we care about, you know, that includes things like whether something's expensive or cheap does not really depend on how much it costs. It depends on what you compare it to. It, one, one thing I was going to uh, heading towards in that question was, um, do, do you think that it helps you in your own ability to overcome conventionality that in a sense you have a, created a somewhat unconventional role for yourself in that we, we kind of all know what a CEO does and can think of lots of good ones we kind of all know what a good chair does and can think of lots of good ones I know that if anybody said to me who is a good uh, vice chair you are essentially the exemplar um, and I, I can't think of many others and you know, was, to, to what degree have you sort of created your there, there own there, unconventional role. There was a guy at Saatchi's who wrote a book about this because he was, I think, the vice chairman and he believed there was a particular value to a kind of number two role, which is you are given a license to be mischievous in a way that you, you aren't if you're actually the top guy. Um, there's also a guy I know called J.P. Rangaswamy who was, for one, at one point, I think, the chief technology officer of BT. He then worked, wonderful guy. And he had a rule, which is after he was about 50 years of age, he wouldn't take any job which was pre-existing, which someone had done before. Because he said, if you step into someone else's shoes, your job is defined by what your predecessor did. And that may not be what you want to do or may not be where you can make the most difference. And it may not be a, a relevant point of comparison. And so he'd only take jobs. He was cool enough and good enough to do this, but he'd only take jobs which had been kind of invented for him. And I think, I think one of the things we do need is we do need a little more, um, I think, you know, payment by the hour in agencies and things tends to mean that everybody is defined very narrowly by a function. And what I've done partly by donating speaking fees to Ogilvy, which I do, okay, is I've bought a degree of autonomy. Now, why the autonomy is valuable, um, I think, is that the, f the world is much more probabilistic than we admit, okay? And actually, um, there is a lot to be said for just making noise and doing random things. Now, it looks like a waste of time objectively, but actually if you make a load of noise and you go to, you know, UK, uh, one of my mantras is go to a conference where everybody doesn't understand why you're going to the conference. Okay. Um, and my argument is, look, there probably won't be any advertising clients there, but if there, if there are, I'm the only advertising guy there. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, and I think, um, we spend too much time trying to optimize what we know and too little time trying to get lucky with discovering things we don't yet know. Now, I'm not suggesting, by the way, that businesses become entirely random. OK, I, I had to explain this to you, Unilever, today. 80% of what you do should be effectively exploit what you already know, like the bees. They follow the waggle dance. 80% of bees follow the waggle dance. We know there's pollen over there. That's where we're going. But 20% of bees go off at random. Or maybe, it, maybe it's the same bees 20% of the time. I'm not quite sure. Okay. But they go off at random and they, they couldn't understand this because it seemed so inefficient, which in the short term, if you're doing quarterly reporting as a bee, these bees would look very wasteful because they were actually ignoring knowledge about pre-existing nectar and pollen and going off on exploratory operations. Then they realized if you don't have the random bees, the hive gets trapped in a local maximum, it gets over-optimized on the past and it starves to death. 
And secondly, even if it doesn't starve to death, it never gets lucky. It never discovers anything new. It never knows how to adapt to changing conditions. And because- Rory, I'm, I'm so sorry. sorry, but we yeah. are, are, are running- so, so, so one of the problems I think is that businesses, everybody is defined by a job function. And I think 20% of your job function should be indistinct to some extent. You use your own judgment. Um, uh, there was a famous comedian, um, someone like, I think it might've been Harry Miller, who's a 1930s comedian, who used to go to football matches and shout at the players, use your own judgment. <laughs> okay, right. And actually, I think giving people a degree of um, discretionary autonomy uh, would actually, um, it would look wasteful in the short term by a narrow measure of efficiency, but in terms of longer term effectiveness, it would actually benefit you. Thank you. Rory, thank you. Thank you to all of our guests today. As ever, Rory, you are such an entertaining and educational speaker. I think we could have been here for, for hours. Um, so thank you for your time. Anna has put in the chat um, our forthcoming um, Marketing Kind uh, uh, next event. So we've got one next Friday um, with, with Joel. But thank you very much for everyone for joining. Um, and we will speak to you all soon. Thank you and good evening. Any, any questions, by the way, I'm on Twitter at Rory Sutherland. So okay. if anybody's got a question, because there's some fantastic questions here which I haven't had time to answer. If anybody wants to ask me on Twitter, just at, at Rory Sutherland, uh, all one word, um, just at me and I'll do my best to answer. Wonderful. Thank you, Rory. Thank Thanks. You.